Hi guys, welcome back to my channel and if you haven't been here before, my name is Ava and I'm a PhD student from UCL. Firstly, I just wanted to talk about an interactive session that I'm going to be running in the Brainstorm Festival. The Brainstorm Festival is a three-day online event from the 17th to the 19th of March that focuses on neuroscience in relation to mental health, robotics and money. On the third day, I'm going to be running an interactive session that's going to look at how stressful life events affect the brain and how we think. So this is going to talk a bit about the neuroscience behind how we process stressful memories, how we regulate emotions, how we cognitively appraise the experience, and lastly, how this relates to the coping strategies that we use. Everyone goes through some sort of stressful life event, whether that's through COVID or through general life. So I'm going to try and make this session as interactive as possible so that you can reflect on how these processes may affect you and those around you. I'm also going to be on the virtual booth for Helpo. Helpo is a mental health startup that looks at improving mental well-being through different therapeutic models such as CBT and third wave therapies. So if you don't want to be part of the interactive session, you're not interested in listening to the talks relating to money, robotics and AI or mental health, then there is a startup section where you can talk to different startups including ours. So if you're interested in this, then you can look at the link below for discounted tickets that are 25 euros for the whole three days, free active to all the interactive sessions. And also if you're a less affluent professional or student from a low income background, then you may be entitled to a free ticket and I posted the link below for that as well. So today I thought I'd talk a little bit about the differences and similarities between social anxiety and paranoia. So paranoia can present itself in a normal population as well as various clinical disorders such as psychosis and schizophrenia. Social anxiety disorder can be a disorder, but it also could involve having an anxiety-like symptom related to other disorders. So first, I'm just going to give an intro into anxiety and paranoia before explaining the differences and similarities and then how this relates to the biology in the brain. So firstly, anxiety is an evolutionary trait that we have had in order to protect ourselves against threats. These threats could have included parental abandonment, threat from more dominant or powerful others such as through bullying or violence, threats of exclusion from being part of a group or threats of deception. Human beings as a species can threaten others in highly adaptive behaviours. Paranoia anxieties, on the other hand, these threats ignite certain thinking patterns that ignite specific defences and styles of thinking. Paranoia anxiety can be specific to fears of bad intentions from dominant or authority figures, sexual partners, gangs such as religious groups, and can be generalised as a trait. So now I'm briefly going to describe the difference between anxiety and paranoia. When people with social anxiety go into a room full of people, they assume that they will create a poor impression. Therefore, their attention switches to their physiological state and the cues that they think are observable by others. An example of this would be focusing on having a shaky voice, trembling hands or sweating. And these individuals can then construct an image of themselves as they appear in the eyes of the other. Being increasingly anxious about showing their anxiety to other people, which may be seen as unattractive or undesirable, such as odd, weak or boring. In the Clark and Well model, social anxiety is maintained by safety behaviours and beliefs. One example would be, if I hide my trembling hands, others won't realise and they'll be less likely to reject me. Paranoia is a dimension of clinical and subclinical experiences in which others are believed to have harmful intentions. Mild paranoia concerns are very prevalent in the general population. Paranoia shares several features with anxiety. These would be increased self-consciousness, social fear, discomfort with social interaction, and anxiety has been seen to be repeatedly associated with paranoid thoughts. Anxiety is predictive of the occurrence of paranoid thoughts and the persistence of persecutory delusions, which would be having ideas that you're being persecuted in a more clinical population. Also, there is evidence that suggests that paranoid thoughts are built on common anxieties such as fear of rejection. One reason why these two things may be associated with each other within research is because they both show heightened self-awareness and social discomfort. In regards to attention, both socially anxious people and paranoid individuals allocate attentional resources to looking for socially threatening information. Once this information has been found, individuals who are anxious would switch to internal attention after perceiving the social threat, competing for self-approval and acceptance, and therefore acutely attentive to how they present to others, seeing themselves in some kind of market where some people are accepted and some people are rejected, trying to find out ways to seem attractive rather than unattractive leading them to monitor the signals that they send to others. Paranoid people may not be concerned about how they look to others or feel this need to compete for a social place, but they do want to protect themselves from the malevolence of others and therefore reduce the harm that this may cause them. 
I'm going to explain some of the reasons why you may experience paranoid ideation. So the, one of the reasons you may be paranoid is because of the anomalous experiences that you have. And this could be hallucinations, so seeing things that aren't there, smelling, tasting, hearing things that aren't there. Or it could even be perceptual abnormalities of things that are there but seem less or more intense than usual. Such as having a sound that sounds really, really loud compared to what it usually sounds like. Or having a taste that seems muted and bland compared to how it usually tastes. So basically any kind of perceptual differences to what the norm would be. These perceptual abnormalities may be caused by increased dopamine levels in the brain, illicit drug use, hearing impairment, early stage sensory processing difficulties, and the idea of something not being right and this feeling of it not being right after having these experiences could then lead on to a thought process that then relates to paranoia. Paranoid ideation secondly could be due to environmental factors such as trauma and stressful life events. Suspicious thoughts are often preceded by stressful life events such as isolation and bullying. These stresses tend to be in the background of anxiety, worry and interpersonal relationship concerns. Often these people have a good reason to believe that their other people can cause you harm and have a good reason to detect these threats because they have indeed been in this situation before. Some people may be submissive, self-monitoring and self-blaming because as a child, this was the best way that they could defend themselves when in a hostile parenting background. So you have affective processes, social factors, and lastly, reasoning bias. And this to me is the key difference between paranoia and social anxiety. Ideas of persecutory content, so feeling like you're persecuted in terms of paranoia, are more likely to be of a more delusional intensity when they are accompanied by biases of reasoning. This would be a failure to consider alternative explanations and reduced data gathering, which means you're more likely to jump to conclusions without facilitating all the knowledge that you may have. So for example, you may think that someone is looking at you and therefore trying to cause you harm. And instead of looking at the alternative explanations for why they're doing that, you jump straight to that one and fixate on that being the one explanation. In more serious clinical cases, paranoid people are often focused on groups. That is, alliances being formed against them. And in some cases, may believe that these alliances will pursue them or seek them out, such as the mafia or a religious group. And in this case, they would feel hunted. Socially anxious people do not feel hunted or sought out unless they also have aspects of paranoia. Although paranoid and socially anxious people differ in their motives, such as being motivated to create a good impression of yourself and seem attractive and desirable to others, compared to paranoid people who are not focused on this, and also how they explain social threats, such as the malevolence of others compared to their own self-inadequacy. They share the obvious fear that others have the power to and are capable of inflicting harm on themselves. The power of others then becomes a crucial factor in both anxiety and paranoia, and therefore can be seen as a common fear, the power of others. Of course, this is a very simplified version and people who are paranoid may show completely different defences depending on whether they think they are superior or inferior to the other person. So here is an example of how it's not that simple. So in animal studies, low-ranking animals can often be harassed and persecuted by more dominant animals. Therefore, the low-ranking animals are highly attentive to social threats. This social harassment has been seen to be associated with submissive behaviour from the low-ranking animals and differences in the dopamine in their brain. It has also been shown that these low-ranking animals, when given amphetamines, increase their vigilance and hiding behaviours. However, high-ranking animals who are given amphetamines increase their threat scan and engage in aggressive behaviour. Therefore, paranoia that may be elicited from amphetamines within these animal studies can be shown to have different kinds of behaviour depending on whether you're seen as a highly ranked individual or lowly ranked individual, which obviously differs in human beings in terms of the context that we feel paranoid in. So now I'm going to talk about the different brain differences in those with social anxiety compared to paranoia. I'm specifically going to look at two regions, the amygdala and the medial prefrontal cortex. I'm going to show how there are similarities in the amygdala activity in social anxiety and paranoia, but the differences in the medial prefrontal cortex and why that may be. This is going to be related to the jumping to conclusions and reasoning bias that I mentioned earlier. When you go through a stressful life event, the fight, flight and freeze response is activated. This causes the increase of cortisol, the stress hormone in your brain, which increases activation of the amygdala, which is what processes fear. When the amygdala is activated, you're more likely to see different kinds of stimuli as threatening and therefore create a defensive behaviour to adapt to that situation. However, if you experience chronic stress or this amygdala activity is not reduced after the stressful event has occurred, 
you're more likely to detect general information in the environment as a threat or as stressful and therefore this anxiety response that is supposed to be an evolved way of surviving continues even when there are no threats present. As we said previously, one of the similarities between social anxiety and paranoia is this increased social awareness of threats and increased threat detection. Therefore, it can be seen that there is increased amygdala activation in both individuals with paranoia and social anxiety. Within this systematic review, although they looked at all kinds of brain regions, the most consistent region that showed consistent results in all the study was the amygdala, and it showed increased activity in the amygdala in those with social anxiety compared to healthy controls. Within a systematic review looking at all of the imaging data for paranoia, there was shown to be increased activation in the amygdala for those who are paranoid compared to those who weren't. This would lead to abnormal emotional recognition and misinterpreting neutral or ambiguous situations as threatening, causing these paranoid thoughts. However, these individuals also showed reduced activity in their medial prefrontal cortex. The medial prefrontal cortex is important for decision making. In this process, it kind of puts together the long-term memory and short-term memory and consolidates all that information to help us decide what the best thing to do is. So this means looking back on our past experiences to see what our expectations are and putting that together to see what our decision will be. As these individuals have less activity in the area associated with decision making and therefore are more likely to jump to conclusions without consolidating all of their memories and experiences, they're more likely to have an enhanced arousal of fear from the amygdala but show impaired processing of threat related material, seeing it as more threatening than they are and consolidating it and jumping to conclusions. Although this amygdala activation and arousal to threatening stimuli is also shown in individuals with social anxiety, the review actually showed that the other consistent finding was increased activity in the medial prefrontal cortex compared to healthy controls, whereas paranoid individuals had decreased activity. In this review, this reduced medial prefrontal cortex activity was associated with increased paranoid thoughts. Therefore, distortions in reality, such as delusions of paranoia, may be due to social judgments going a bit awry or inappropriately finding personal relevance to things in social situations. So to understand increase in the activity for those who are socially anxious, I'm going to first explain top-down processing. Top-down processing is a cognitive process that initiates our thoughts flowing down to lower level functions such as our sensations. This is in contrast to bottom-up processing, which is the process of our senses providing information to our brain and therefore changing our thoughts. An example of this would be burning our hand. So we have the sensation first and then the thought process that that is a dangerous situation and we will avoid it in the future. So here are some interpretations of the finding now taking that into account. One interpretation could be that people with social anxiety try and do top-down processing where they activate this region, medial prefrontal cortex, having this reflection of their thoughts and how they see themselves in terms of activating the medial prefrontal cortex, but this regulatory effect doesn't actually reach the amygdala due to disturbed connectivity, or it's not a strong enough impulse that controls for the enhanced activation of the amygdala. So another, another interpretation is that when you are socially anxious, you try and suppress your thoughts and feelings. When you try and suppress these anxious thoughts, you have increased activation in the control area of the medial prefrontal cortex. However, you're not able to reduce the arousal in the amygdala because you're not rethinking these thoughts and having thought reappraisal. So this suppressive behavior may cause more activation in the control region where decision-making occurs, but it doesn't actually affect how you think because you're just simply suppressing it and therefore you're still emotionally aroused to threatening stimuli. There are many other different kinds of interpretations, but I think that the main difference in increased activity in this region, in social anxiety and reduced activity related to jumping to conclusions in paranoia kind of shows some of the distinctions. There are, of course, many other brain areas involved and I didn't want to overcomplicate it. So hopefully you got a better understanding as to what the differences and similarities are between these two different constructs. So thank you for watching. If you have any ideas of future videos or any comments on this video, then please comment below. If you liked the video, then I would really appreciate a like and subscribe and I hope to see you next week.